Good morning. Welcome to worship here this seventh Sunday of Easter and also a happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you. And uh, we take this moment to remember all those who gave the greatest sacrifice to secure our freedoms and uh, of opportunity to worship God freely as we do in this country. And we praise God for all those who, who have sacrificed their lives uh, to make that happen. Today, uh, one announcement I want to make sure I cover is the 20th anniversary celebration of Open Arms is coming next weekend. Well, this coming weekend. So June 4th, Saturday, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. over at the Maple Campus. We're going to have all sorts of fun for everybody uh, in the family. We're going to celebrate how uh, this ministry has impacted our community and been a, a vital part of our mission here at, uh, at Ascension Lutheran Church to care for and reach out to um, the families of West Wichita with the love of Christ. So I encourage you um, to show up, to come and celebrate with us from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, sometime in, in there next Saturday. Uh, other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I know a lot of us are, are just grieving and in shock with the, the latest mass shooting there in Texas. And, and our hearts go out to those and we pray uh, for God's comfort for those who are, who are reeling um, from its aftermath and... Um, it's sad. It's, it's just sad. And we pray uh, that God would work through this tragedy uh, for his good purposes. But I also want to take that this moment to remind you all that we have uh, pretty good security here at Ascension Lutheran Church. We have a committee designated for it, and it might be inconvenient, especially if you show up late to worship, to find the doors locked. But that is for a reason. It's for your safety and security. So if you come and the doors are locked, um, that's why is because we're trying to keep things safe. So come to worship on time, right? We got gotcha. you. Um, I think that's, oh yes, Rocky Meese is the new executive director at uh, Fairmount Ministries, and he will be sharing a few words here and telling about Fairmount. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be having one of our biggest fundraisers 
in June and July. We're selling fireworks at the Big Tent. Uh, it's on Kellogg, just uh, west of Andover. So we're just across the county line. There probably is a reason why we're on the other side of the county line. Maybe, uh, <laughs> but, but it is a lot of fun. We need about a, a thousand volunteers. So it, it's kind of crazy, but we have a lot of churches that support us and uh, it'll give you a chance to meet the folks out at Peace. Uh, Peace has been doing this for a long time in Andover and Zion Newton is the other partner that's out, out there. And then with all of the Ascension or all the uh, Fairmont folks, uh, we'll get uh, people from all the other congregations in town. So come out, join us for a shift or two or three. If you work two shifts, you get a shirt, you know. Anyway, thank you. Yes, thank you, Rocky. Yeah, so I encourage you guys to help out Fairmont with volunteering this summer. That's all we have for announcements, so I invite you to stand as we begin our worship. Open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Bless
Blessed be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship him. Please be seated. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to Thee, for those in peril on the sea. O Christ, the Lord of hill and plain, o'er which our traffic runs amain, by mountain pass or valley low, whoever Lord thy people go, and keep them by thy guarding hand from every peril on the land. O Spirit, whom the Father sent to spread abroad the firmament, O wind of heaven, by thy might save all who dare the eagle's flight and keep them by thy watchful care from every peril in the air. O Trinity of love and power, our people shield in dangers our from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go. Thus evermore shall rise to thee glad praise from air and land. 
and see. O Trinity of love and power, our people shield in dangers hour from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go. The evermore shall rise to thee, glad praise from air and land and sea. Amen. Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were want, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was all in about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. <clears throat> for, he has, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Acholamia, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for him, and the lot fell on Matthias. And when he was numbered, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> the epistle lesson is taken from Revelation chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of the nation. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the, Lord, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servant 
what must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gate. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and adulterers and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plague described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel as we sing the verse. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the hands. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Jesus said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We sing the hymn of the day.
Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. I came across this article not long ago from uh, firstthings.com, and the title of the article was The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism, and uh, I highly encourage you to check it out, firstthings.com, The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism. So in this article, the author Aaron Wren talks about uh, how evangelical Christians have gone about their witness and evangelism over the last few decades here in our country. And uh, as a disclaimer, we as LCMS Lutherans don't exactly fit in with the category of evangelicals, and neither do we fit in the category of mainline Protestants or Catholics. We're kind of in a separate place, um, just to let you know the the people who write about these things. But I think what he writes about evangelicals uh, is very informative for us today. So in the article, he talks about three stages of American secularization or becoming less religious. So the first um, stage is the positive world, and Wren says that was before 1994 in this country. In this world, being a good Christian is part of being a good citizen. They are one and the same. Being a Christian publicly enhances one's status. So if you want to be a successful businessman in that world, you were a Christian for the most part. Um, Christian morality is the basis for societal morals, and going against them has negative consequences. So the cultural values and morals uh, match really well with Christian values and morals. Some of you remember these days. Uh, Second world is the neutral world from 1994 to 2014. In this world, Christianity no longer has a privileged status, but it's not disfavored. You know, you can be a Christian. It's about the same as being a Muslim or Buddhist or any other kind of religion um, that you choose. It's all on the level playing field. Um, Christian morality still holds some sway in this world. There's this remnant of what one ought to do and what one ought not to do, uh, people kind of basically assume. But then, uh, 2015 to the present, we have the negative world, uh, the world in which we live today. And Wren says that the, the shift happened with the Obergefell Supreme Court ruling uh, that legalized homosexual unions nationally. Uh, he says this was a turning point in our country. In this world, society views Christianity negatively. Being known as a Christian is a social negative, especially in elite circles. Um, Here in Wichita, Kansas, we might not not feel it quite so much, um, but definitely it is there, and it is more so in other parts of our country. Christian morality is shunned and seen as a threat to the public moral order. So, um, yeah, you you Christians have backwards morality and need to change is the reality in the negative world. So how did evangelicals go about witnessing in the positive world? Well, uh, they had two different strategies, Ren points out, the culture war strategy and the seeker-friendly strategy. Um, The culture war strategy was also known as the religious right or the moral majority. Um, You might have remembered these days, back in the 70s and 80s, it was a a pretty big movement. And... uh, it was kind of in a knee-jerk reaction to the sexual revolution of the 60s and trying to fight against that. And we got to go take territory back for Jesus in our country. And we are the majority, and we need to make it, make it known. Uh, you might have remembered a guy by the name of Jerry Falwell. He was big on this technique for uh, witness to uh, culture. Seeker-friendly, well, these people assumed that there are large numbers of people who were friendly toward Christianity, who wanted to be Christian, but there were some barriers that were keeping them from doing so. And so these leaders decided that they would downplay these barriers, and some of those barriers were uh, denominational affiliation and traditions. Uh, so this is where you get the rise of contemporary music and, and uh, you know, really kind of seeing what the needs of the community are and meet those specific needs and, and try to get people in the doors that way. Some leaders of this movement were um, Bill Hybels in Chicago and Rick Warren in Orange County, California, who... Uh, did really well with the seeker-friendly um, kind of evangelism strategy. Then we get the neutral world witness, uh, 1994 to 2014 again, and uh, this was all about cultural engagement. So we're not going to be combative like the culture warriors. We're going to find commonality 
with the culture and kind of find where we can have mutual ground and have you know, civil conversations using reason and logic to persuade people to um, accept Christianity and to, to kind of make it a, a tenable way of doing things. Uh, one person who did really well with this in New York City was Tim Keller at Redeemer Presbyterian. Um, he was one of the most famous to use this kind of method of evangelism, but other tra- churches like Hillsong United and a lot of the mega churches you still see today kind of practice this sort of witness and evangelism, engaging the culture. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in the neutral world, world anymore. And Aaron Wren, the author of this article, says the evangelicals do not have a great way to engage a world that is hostile to Christianity. So what is our negative world witness supposed to look like? That's the question. What are we going to do, folks? How are we going to reach people with the gospel? Well, Jesus and his disciples lived in a negative world. There were a lot of people opposed to what Jesus was bringing into the world. So I think we need to go back to scripture here to see how to engage our culture with the gospel. Now, when you think about evangelism, you probably don't go immediately to John chapter 17 where Jesus has his high priestly prayer, right? That's not typically where we go. We usually go to like Matthew 28 or something like that. But I contend that there's a lot of information in here that informs us on how we go about um, outreach and evangelism. So rule number one Jesus shows us in this prayer is prayer is important for reaching the lost. Prayer is a key for the vitality of God's church. And in this prayer, Jesus prays for his disciples, and he thanks the Father for giving him these disciples. And he says that I have given them your word, Father, and protect them from the evil one. And your word is truth. You know, sanctify them in the truth. But then the prayer gets, um, you know, shifts a little bit from praying for his disciples in the room to this. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So who, who's that? Who's Jesus talking about there? You? Yeah? Me? That's who Jesus is praying for in this prayer right here. The entire Christian church on earth, past, present, and future, he's praying for all those who would believe the testimony of the apostles. The church's foundation is Jesus, and how did we find out about Jesus? Well, it's because these men were entrusted with this good news, and they shared it uh, in spoken and written form so that the whole world might know who Jesus is. And so Jesus, if you think about it, he was thinking about you when he was praying this prayer. How neat is that? You know, he was thinking about you when he was praying this prayer. Thinking about you and me, and I assure you, he is still interceding on our behalf before the Father today. So what is Jesus praying for? Well, that leads me to rule number two here global evangelism strategy, unity in the church. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us. So Jesus is praying for unity in the church. This is going to change the world. If, if my people will be one, my disciples will be one in spirit and in doctrine and teaching. Now, why do you think Jesus uh, included this in his prayer here before his crucifixion? Perhaps it was because he knew just how prone his disciples were to quarreling, to division, and just how prone his disciples are today to these sort of things. This is why he's praying for it, right? We still um, tend towards quarreling and and, uh, division in God's church. Would you say that uh, the Christian church on earth is united today? If you see a few head shakes, it's not super united. Does anybody know how many denominations there are? 34,000. That is how many denominations. Yeah, 34,000 of them. What about, what about at least us in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? Are we all united in spirit and doctrine and don't quarrel about anything? Yeah, that's funny, funny, funny. No, we're prone to it too. What about here at Ascension Lutheran Church? At least our little congregation here, we are all united in spirit and doctrine and practice and everything, right? Maybe, maybe not. Well, Ren in his article talks about just how divided evangelicals are and how this is really hurting their witness to the world. Um, their divisions are numerous. Divisions about social justice activism. 
you know, they're lobbing grenades at each other about that sort of thing. Other evangelicals are, are arguing about, uh, you know, that, well, that pastor and his church are going woke, and he's failing his flock over there. That's not good. Or that pastor and it's, that church over there has totally abandoned Christian, traditional Christian teachings on human sexuality and gender. They're, they're going the wrong way. Or that church over there is too political. Or that church over here is not political enough. They're not active enough. And they just throw grenades and they fight and they bicker. Well, do you know what's at the root of all of this, this division and hatred? It's a nasty three-letter word. You could probably get, oh, I heard it, sin. That's the problem, folks. Sin is the problem. And uh, a Latin phrase that theologians have used to describe sin is en curvatus set, or curved in on oneself. When we start focusing on our own desires rather than what God's word desires for us, then we miss the mark of what God wants. It's uh, the oldest temptation in the book, right? Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And so, as God's people stray away from his word, that's where, that's where division increases. That's where hatred and fighting and bickering and quarreling among God's people increases. As we do whatever we see fit in our own eyes to do, that's when the wheels come off of God's church and in society in general. Individualism. You probably have heard this word before. But it is the moral and political philosophy that emphasizes the intrinsic worth of the individual. And this idea has revolutionized the world and has caused a whole bunch of human flourishing material prosperity, especially in Western democracies. Um, it has you know, said that government exists to secure the rights of individual citizens. And the, the, those rights include the right to life, the light, right to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The equal protection for every individual under the law, regardless of, of wealth or creed or class or, or race or anything else. All are equal under the law. And we as Christians would totally agree with the intrinsic worth of each individual. Yes, every human being was created in the image of God. And God loves every individual so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for them, for everybody, for every individual. However, as a people, as a culture, and a society, um, if we don't tamper, temper our freedom with personal moral restraint, then things go off the rails. If we don't have something that ties us spiritually and ethically and morally and culturally, if we don't have some common cohesion, well, we get where we're at today, right? Rod Dreher wrote a book called The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation. He does give a little idea of what he thinks would be a great path forward for uh, living in the negative world. In his book, he quotes Charles Taylor saying, Many people feel called to do this, feel they ought to do this, feel that their lives would somehow be wasted or unfulfilled if they didn't do it. What is it? Following your own heart, no matter what society says, or the church, or anybody else. Else. What's the problem with that, though? You and I know what's in the human heart, right? Yeah, all sorts of wretchedness and evil and sin. So this is not good advice, but this is what the culture tells us to do, right? Follow your heart. Follow your truth. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. You do you. Rod Dreher uh, says this. In response to that statement, this kind of thinking is devastating to every kind of social stability, but especially to the church. The church, a community that authoritatively teaches and disciplines its members, cannot withstand a revolution in which each member becomes, in effect, his own pope. Churches, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, that are nothing more than a loosely bound assembly of individuals committed to finding their own truth, are no longer the church in any meaningful sense because there is no shared belief. Everybody doing their own thing. Believe in their own thing, whatever they want to believe. 
Billy Graham was once asked how many uh, religions are in the United States, and he uh, asked the question in return, uh, how many people are in the United States? 300 million? Yeah, there's about 300 million religions. This is how individualism has seeped into every part of our culture and society. I am the determiner of truth that they may all be one. This is Jesus' prayer for you and me today, that they may be one. But how in the world is this possible, right? With everybody with their own opinions and beliefs and values, and how could God's church be one here in the broken, messed up world infested with sin? Well, I'll tell you, with, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In Jesus, we can be one. We are made one in God's church, the one holy Christian and apostolic church on earth through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has the power to unite us through his person, through his work. In Jesus, there is no slave or free, Jew or Greek, male or female, rich or poor. We are all one in Jesus. Those who have, have repented of sin and cling to, to faith in Jesus are united with all the family of God, the spiritual unity in Jesus. All those whose sin has been washed away by the blood of Christ and through their baptism are now part of this one holy Christian church on earth. And we as Lutherans, our confessions, Augsburg Confession, article number seven, says it is enough for unity in church, in the church, that the gospel be preached purely and the sacraments administered rightly. Yes, we believe that happens in this church and in Lutheran churches all over the place, but it could happen other places too. We leave that open um, to God. God only knows where his true church is. Um, But there is unity in that, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you and I might hope for a day like where we can all get along as Christians, you know, and settle our differences, but uh, I wouldn't hold your breath. You know, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Because we, we live in a broken world, and yes, we strive for unity, and we're going to keep on trying to have ecumenical conversations with other church bodies to try to find where we have commonality, but divisions will continue. But our hope is not in that. Our hope is when Jesus comes back, he's going to put all division and all hatred aside and establish his reign forever, do away with all that, so we get to enjoy um, singing praises to the Lamb upon his throne and his kingdom which will have no end. That's where our hope is. But we still haven't got to the evangelism part of this text, right? It doesn't really talk about it yet. Well, let's take a look at verse 21 again here. That they may, be all, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you see that? Unity in the body of Christ leads to the whole world knowing that Jesus is for real, the Son of God, sent to save the world. Now the individual who believes that has the opportunity then of accepting that or denying it. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you loved me. Unity and love in the body of Christ is a powerful witness to a world filled with division and hatred. We've seen plenty of examples of hatred and where that leads, resentment, bitterness, where that goes. We've seen plenty of examples lately. But this unity in the body of Christ, when the body of Christ loves one another, when we strive for unity in teaching and unity in practice and love of one another, the whole world sees it and like, wow, that is something different. I kind of want to be a part of that. It's kind of scary, kind of weird, but I also want to be, I'm attracted to it. That's what the world sees. So practically, how does this work out, though? How do we do this? How do we achieve this? Well, we let Jesus' prayer for our unity happen when we subject everything, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, our actions, our time, our money, our relationships, when we subject all of it to the Word of God. When we wake up in the morning and we crave the word of God more than a cup of coffee, 
this is when we let Jesus' prayer come true in our lives. When we read, mark, and inwardly digest the Word of God, when we come and hear it preached, and we submit ourselves to the preaching of God's Word, when we, when we study it with other people, when we share it with our friends and families, when we pray it, when we seek it, when we're in trouble, when we seek it, when we have times of joy and praise, when we consume it and it tastes like sweet honey on our lips, we let Jesus' prayer for unity happen in us. So as we cherish God's word, he works his work in us, leading us towards unity. And it looks like my next slide is not there. I had a nice quote from Luther, but... uh, Luther reiterates the point that the fruit of the unity in God's church is evangelism. Because the more we submit to the word of God, the more this leads to witness in the world. Word, the word of God becomes more and more powerful and more and more palatable when we see it in action in God's people. It is so powerful when, and pleasant and good when God's people dwell together in unity. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a huge witness to a world filled with hatred and division. The world isn't impressed with our faith, per se, individually. What's impressive is when our faith is aligned together behind the word of God. That is a powerful witness, when we are together behind God's word. So, as we grow in the knowledge and understanding and application of God's word in our own lives, the more powerful our witness. Conversely, the more ignorant we are of God's word, the more heresy we have and the more division we have, and the worse our witness is to the world. So, while evangelicals struggle to find out a way to engage the negative uh, world with the gospel, um, we don't really have to change anything, right? Right? God's commands are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He has expected the same things from his people. Hear the word of the Lord and do what it says. Hear the word of the Lord and do what it says. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. God's word never changes. And so let us be a people committed to prayer, being dependent on God in prayer, committed to seeking unity in love and peace and in doctrine here, as God's church, let us be committed to sharing this good news with the world. Amen. At this time, we continue our worship by gathering our tithes and our offerings, giving back to God a portion of all that he has given us to further his mission here of making disciples of Jesus and reaching the lost. So I invite you at this time to bring forth um, your offerings.
Please stand as we sing the Te Deum. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we include prayers for Bob Bakken, Don Cranston, Mary Ann Fuller, Mike Lindeback, John Lundbay, Blade, Patrice Maurer, Herb Wacker, and all those who were affected by the shooting in Texas. We go to the Lord in prayer. 
O righteous Father, your Son obeyed your holy will for the sake of our salvation. Through your Spirit, give your church on earth unity of faith, that the world may know that you sent your Son to rescue us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the church, you have sustained your people through the ages by the apostles' witness to the death and resurrection of your Son. Raise up from among us faithful pastors in every age. Keep our missionaries, pastors, and overseers faithful to you in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have placed us in communities and families where we are nurtured and grow in the knowledge of your word and love of you. May our parents in this congregation, the staff at Open Arms and our preschool, be faithful teachers of that word to our children and those not yet of the kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifices of those who serve faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and in the defense of our land. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, our hearts ache as we mourn for the senseless death of those involved in the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Grant comfort to the grieving and work through this tragedy to turn more hearts to you. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, you have seated Christ at your right hand for our deliverance. Remember all who are afflicted with disease and injury, especially those that we have named. Give them health and strength according to your will. Sustain them in faith, knowing that for Jesus' sake, you will raise them in glory on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us your Spirit of truth, whom you promised through the Father, to, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.